Hi, this is John T. Pierce, and welcome to today's webinar. We've got an exciting webinar uh, for everyone planned today. Uh, it's called Making an Impact with Your Voice. So in terms of today's uh, agenda, uh, we've got a great number of uh, speakers with, with us today. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Tony Crawford, who's the MD of Crawford Communications. Tony's going to be talking us through uh, speech impact or ways that we can uh, use our voice to improve uh, improve customer service. Uh, we've got some uh, of the latest uh, breaking research from Dr. Diane Hazlett, uh, who's head of the School of Communication at the University of Ulster. We'll be talking us through how to avoid vocal stress, which is very much in the news. Uh, and we've also got Richard Kenny, uh, the EMEA segment manager from uh, Plantronics, uh, which was on a webinar with us last year. And uh, Richard is going to be talking about acoustic uh, intelligence and how we can get the best possible uh, voice quality down the, down the telephone line. So quite a packed uh, agenda overall. Uh, we're just going to um, start off before that. I'm just going to um, share a poll with you. And that poll is, have you ever been offered voice training? Results there and share the results up on the screen. And the results are... That's uh, quite fascinating. 80% of people have never been offered uh, offered voice training. Uh, Diane, I mean, is, that's a staggering amount of people. Um, is that what you would expect? I think it's it's very consistent with what we our findings have been in, in talking to call centres. Clearly, there is very effective training ongoing, um, but probably not very much that's directly focused on the voice and its impact in communication. Oh, right. Wonderful. So, well, hopefully at the end of... Um, Today, there may be a few more people who are thinking a bit more carefully about voice training. Uh, we've got another poll I'd like to uh, share with you, and that is, what impact does tone of voice have on the service that you deliver? Look at the, the results. This is a surprise to me, I've got to say, and we'll share the results. 83% of the audience uh, say that it is, um, it is very, uh, very important, and we have about 117 people in the audience, so that's quite a large, uh, quite a large poll. Um, only one percent is saying moderately important. So I guess the um, the messages and, and, and uh, presentations we're going to give today are going to be um, are going to be quite uh, quite interesting to uh, to everyone. Well, that lines us up very nicely for our uh, first presenter of the day, uh, which is uh, Tony Crawford. Uh, Tony is the uh, managing director of Crawford Communications, and um, uh, is going to be talking to us about speech impact. So, Tony, if you'd like to uh, uh, get going, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, hello, everyone. We're just going to get the slide up here. And uh, I'm pleased that so many of you are believe that tone of voice is important. Let me just introduce you to somebody that I'm not sure many of you would recognize. And this is a chap called... Don LaFontaine. Now, you might not recognize his picture, but I can guarantee all of us would recognize his voice. This man has been the most successful voiceover artist for movie trailers ever. He died sadly in 2008, but he, he, he was the voice of over 5,000 movie trailers, probably the wealthiest voice artist that ever existed for over several, several decades. Terminator 2, Shrek, Fatal Attraction, Chicken Run, you name it. Don was the voice that set us all up with expectations to go and see it. He was once described as a man you would expect to be seven foot tall. He had a deep voice as if he was, and a man who had a voice that would be the same as if he'd been smoking cigarettes since childhood. Uh, look him up on YouTube and play some of his tones back. Now, he is the commercial end of voice, and we are in business. And we all have our own voice signature, the same as Don's voice signature was quite uh, recognizable. And the collective voices of your agents in the contact center represent effectively the sound of your company. It's your company brand. It's the personality of us as individuals is reflected in our voice and collectively the personality of our company and our business. Now, of course, we're talking about telephone conversations. Now, telephone conversations are a little different to face-to-face. -to -face. Now, I spend a lot of my time working with management teams, director teams, uh, sales and marketing teams who are dealing with people in a face-to-face -face environment. And the, the components of what makes your communication get through to people 
when we're in a meeting or we're face to face with somebody one to one basically relate down to less than 10% is actually to do with what you say over three and a half times more important than what you say is how you say it and over half is down to the body language the gestures the eye contacts the smiles and things now, of course on the telephone in the contact center environment or even on a mobile phone the body language disappears and the statistics then change where words don't go up that much only to about 13 percent the research tells us and over 85 percent about 87 percent is down to the tone of voice so for those of you that voted that tone of voice was important you're absolutely right it is absolutely crucial it's about not so much what your agents say when they're on the phone to customers it's more to do with how they say it so we're here to look at speech impact which is the human component in conversations on the phone the customer conversations and that's what we specialize in that's what um, I've spent a lot of time working on and developing into a program that uh, customers can use. Now, Plantronics approached me, Philip Van Hoot, the, 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 the boss of Plantronics for Europe, uh, Richard Kenny, who you're going to hear from later today, and they said, we're dealing with a lot of the technical side of this, with the headsets and the infrastructures. We need to also impact the human component. Now, when we're on calls, and all your agents are on calls, we've obviously got three things I think we all want to achieve. We need to be heard clearly. We need to think about what we say and this tends to be where a lot of work in the contact center environment is put in is to work out what to say and then the component I'm dealing with here is about how we say it. Now in Plantronics words they call this acoustic intelligence. Richard will talk about this a little bit later in more detail but it's about a pyramid where comfort and fit for headsets the systems in place to make sure that you have good voice intelligibility through the lines and then the top piece of the pyramid is the human factor this is the speech impact component now it's a little bit like if John T presented me this morning with the latest HP or Dell laptop computer all bells and whistles with the latest software the full Wi-Fi lots of gigs and guides and basically said there you are Tony you've got everything you need to be productive that's all very well but unfortunately if for example I was not able to type I didn't have that human component to interface with the machine and the software then I'm afraid I wouldn't get a lot of productivity out of the fabulous laptop that uh, John T has presented to me so I'm just trying to work out from here which one of us is in, in the picture there <laughs> I'm not going to comment at all but it's not me so we're talking the difference between hardware and software and the voice is the software probably somebody who puts it a little bit more eloquently than ever I could is uh, Dr. Maya Angelou the well-known human rights uh, activist and she said famously at one of her rallies that people will soon forget what you said but they will never forget how you made them feel if you think about that on every customer conversation that your agents have every day with your customers this is extremely relevant they will never forget how your employee your team member made them feel and we need to address this as a serious business competitive edge now of course your customers come into some of the calls I'm sure not in the best of moods but we can't have them leaving like that what we want is we want enthusiastic customers people who are happy and voice awareness is the thing that really helps allow people to feel differently about us so we're going to look at that now human beings I'm a parent and I'm not sure how many of you out there our parents have children but you've probably got um, nephews and nieces or friends with kids but you know babies don't have any benefit of language to deal with at all because they're too young and yet they are perfectly able to communicate to adults exactly their needs and desires and how they're feeling so for example if they're hungry or they need their nappy changing they scream the message is very clear to an adult we do something about it equally if they're really happy and having a nice time they smile and laugh and giggle so the words that we use and all the effort that is put into training and manuals that goes on in your world in the contact center training environment about getting the right words the right sentences the right phrases I would suggest to you to be a little controversial 
is by far not the answer to the question here if you want enthusiastic customers who are loyal to your brand, loyal to your service, and speak highly of you when they're not on the calls. Now, let me tell you a little bit about voice as it is transmitted. Now, back in 1915, which is actually even before John T. or I were around <laughs> on the planet, that was the year of the first transcontinental telephone call. Now, there was a chap called Professor Ian Crandall who did a book and a study after that two years later, which was published on speech, and he determined, quite importantly, that uh, in terms of intelligibility, it is the consonants in the alphabet used in words that determine understanding and articulation. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that on old analog-based systems on the phone, consonants are not determinable. Now we're in the world of high-definition audio, and consonants can now be clearly, clearly heard. So if Diane here called me up yesterday like she did, and she said, hey, Tony, how are you? And I said, I'm sailing. She could hear that on an analog phone as if I'm failing, and then she's saying, oh dear, what can I do to help? Whereas in fact, I'm having a fantastic time on my boat. So the meaning and understanding can be quite different based on what consonant is stressed and how that is heard. Now, the research that Plantronics had done, they provided me, says that between three and four seconds a call is lost in the contact center environment per call just on poor intelligibility, just misunderstanding because consonants wow, are not stressed right. correctly. So this is quite a big factor when you multiply the number of calls going on in your contact center per day. You think about it, but you're probably talking the figures quoted are for an average size uh, uh, center across the UK up to a million euros per annum cost wastage. Now, if that's productivity, that's hard-nosed numbers, and if that was to happen in manufacturing environments, you'd close the factory. So this is serious. Now, here's my one technical drawing of the session. This is, as you can see, roughly a neck and a nose and a mouth. Now, what I want you um, to uh, understand here is about how can we make the most of the consonants. So I want everyone to stand up. Wherever you are, whatever computer you're looking at, no matter what the environment, you have to get off, off your feet. This is interactive. We're all stood up in Everyone the room here. Everyone's stood up in here, which is very good. It's a, yeah, very good, very good. So we need you out there to be doing the same. Now, um, let's just be clear about what is a consonant and what is a vowel. A consonant is, an, is the hard letters in the alphabet, the S's, the T's, and the P's. The vowel sounds, just try it, an S, a T, and a P. The vowel sounds, yes, they're doing it here. The vowel sounds are the oohs and the ahs sounds, Ooh, okay? Ah. Ooh, ah, eh. Right, fantastic. Yeah. Now, you can see on the diagram, the little orange blob is actually the vocal cords. So if you're standing up, put two fingers, maybe from your left hand, keep the two fingers together and put them over your Adam's apple, roughly where the, where the vocal cords are. And then after me, we'll do all this together all around the world. We're going to do, on the count of three, we'll do a oo, ah, eh, okay? So, one, two, three, oo, ah, eh. Right, what's happening? What's ha how, what can you feel with your fingers? What's happening? It's sort of vibration. Isn't it? Vibration. The team here is saying vibration. I believe that might be the same for all of you out there, too. Right, now let's keep the two fingers on the Adam's apple, uh, where the vocal cords are. Now, let's do an S and a T and a P, okay? So, on the count of three, everybody join in. One, two, three. S, S T, T P. P. Right, now what's happening on the two fingers on the vocal cords? Nothing. They're all shaking their heads. Absolutely correct. Now, of course, you can all sit down now. That is because the vocal cords, which are flats, are the vowel sounds. Mm. The consonants, the ones that determine understanding and articulation, are framed by the way we use our tongue, our teeth, our mouth. It's about being expressive with our mouth and face and tongue and teeth. And that's what we need to work on in order to be clear when we're on telephone calls. So what tools do we actually have to work with to become more effective with our voice? So I'm going to share you a couple of tips 
in this short session. Now today, here we go, I call it the four P's. Power, which is about projecting your voice, breathing. Pitch, which is about varying the pitch of the voice, the tone. Pace is about speed, as the word says, and pauses, very important, we'll look at that in a minute, is about putting in some breaks. So let's then look at the power projection piece. Well, first of all, if you're going to do anything with the other three, there has to be some projected volume in your voice to start with, otherwise you can't change it. And this all comes back to breathing and making sure that your agents and your teams, you know, have practice sessions to start breathing well. Get some air in so that it can come out. I would say that we want to change the tone of our voice, obviously, to reflect what we're saying. But you have to have some projection there in the first place, otherwise no variance. What about pitch? Now, the, the great thing about pitch is that the one thing that nobody likes and gets bored with is somebody who is monotone. You know, that's when we fall asleep and start doing our emails and don't listen. So we need to get light and shade into pitch. Now, the great thing about pitch is that you can reflect the meaning of what you say by taking your tone up or bringing it down. So if I'm saying to you, we've got good news and sales are up, I take my voice with the sentiment of the words I'm using to convey my message. And it is that sentiment that is determined by the voice tone is much more important in the communication than the actual words. The opposite of that would be, of course, bad news, sales are down. We take the pitch down. So voice needs to be used to reflect the message that we're trying to put across. And I can see a, a real big application for that within, within the contact center, because I think that's probably the area we're probably most guilty of is, is keeping it a sort of a, a fairly even ability and being able to take your voice down to build empathy if there's a problem or take it up as you're trying to resolve a problem. I, I, I think that could be very, very powerful. The third one on the P's is pace. This is about speed. It's about speeding up, slowing down. Again, we don't want anything that is too monotone and too standard. We want a bit of speed up, a bit of slow down. Look at pace. And finally, pause. If any of you sent me an email after the webinar, you would not send it to me in a big block of text. You would put in paragraphs, punctuation. The same goes with when we're speaking on the phone. We need to put in breaks, introduce some silence, and allow people to digest what we're saying and allow us to think about how we present the next section. So that's the four Ps. That's what you can work on with your teams. And the final uh, item I've got here before I hand back to John T is don't forget you're working with a microphone your teams are working for big shifts sat behind a desk talking into a microphone make sure they are hydrated six to eight gla half pint glasses of water a day minimum for anybody that's working on the phone uh, a minimum and also to be perfectly honest when you're long-term planning for the environments that your teams are working in think about how much easier it is to get changes in tone of voice when you're standing up. Where, what do you see your people doing? Slumped in the chair, sat back, very difficult to get customers excited in that position. John T. Thank you very much for that, for that Tony. I'm uh, quite interested in point about standing up because Tony was actually stood up during that entire, uh, during that, that, that entire presentation. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we've now got another uh, poll for you and um, we're going to start uh, focusing in on voice stress. And the poll is, how have you lost days due to voice stress? That's, for instance, due to people uh, losing their voice. So if you'd like to uh, vote on that now, the answers are yes, no, or don't know. So if you could um, uh, vote, on the, uh, vote on the answers there. Just a couple more people to uh, vote. Thank you very much. We'll just close the uh, vote there and share the results. So what we're seeing is that uh, about 49% of people have lost their have lost days due to voice stress. That's probably higher than uh, I'd anticipated. But, but Diane, does that sort of feel that fit, feel instinctively right with your your sort of results? I think actually it's probably a bit higher than I'd have expected. Um, we've identified through the research that you know 10% had identified they had voice problems per yeah. se. Although there are a lot num lot more who are identifying changes to the voice and voice that's fatigued and tired. So yeah. losing voice days is really important in this setting, isn't it? 
Yeah, and I guess there may be, uh, we've got about 138 people online uh, currently, so it may well be that uh, you know, what we're seeing is that there's a sort of big problem and, and people are coming, coming to us to uh, find out what they can do about it. So, um, so that, that's absolutely uh, interesting, interesting results that are coming up there. Um, what I'd like to now do is pass the baton across to uh, uh, Dr. Diane uh, Hazlett, who's the uh, Head of Communication at the University of Ulster and it's going to be taking us through some of the latest, uh, latest research on this area. Thank you very much, Jonty. Um, it's great to be here. Um, and also to hear Tony talk about communication. Um, my background is that I'm a speech and language therapist. I've worked in communication for, for a very long time, but also with voice over the last 20 years. I've been working in voice care and voice care research. Um, one of the things that we'd identified at an early stage was that as professional voice users, using our voices in a context particularly work context for long periods of time, we're putting quite a, a lot of demands on our voice. Um, Tony showed the diagram, I'll show a later one, but uh, the vocal mechanism is an incredibly flexible one. It's one that allows us when we get a sore throat or a bit of a cold to feel a bit better, sometimes a late night or being at the football match, um, the vocal folds get a bit strained, they get swollen, and two days later we're back to normal. We've got a resilient, very flexible voices, a unique signature as Tony says. Um, but what can happen is that we, we need to really think about maximizing the use of voice, particularly in the business environment. And it's something that became very clear to us as we started to go into call centers and to ask the questions from call handlers themselves. So this piece of research um, was funded by the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health. And it built on some comments that we got from call handlers themselves who identified very quickly that they had some difficulties. Um, trying to change slides here, Richard, that's lovely. Um, and what, what I want to show is just, just a few of the comments that came from the call handlers themselves. Um, so for example, um, when they were talking about their, their work environment, some of them identified you know, what we hear is that the background is noisy. Um, but also that it's developing the noise cycle in a sense. So the noisier the background is, even with very effective headsets, um, it's distorting how they feel they need to produce their voice to be heard. Um, what was interesting in our subsequent research was that 60% said they had difficulty in making themselves heard against background noise. That's a huge percentage. Um, that might have been our sample of 14 call centers, but it also asks questions about the, the technical equipment and, and the setup of the, of the environment. Also that they felt 41% failed to be heard by the customer. And again, that might simply be because their communication skills or articulation or intelligibility wasn't as clear as it needs to be. So various reasons for that. Um, using the headset, be, and, and clearly for all of you, training is really critical. So that's a very important part of the process. But they were making the links um, that actually getting used to the headset within that environment takes a little bit of time. Um, some of them already were identifying, even for new starts, the fact that if they were in long shifts, talking for uh, an eight-hour shift, for example, that, that their voice could be, their throat could be quite sore by the end of that. We also did a number of interviews with call center managers, and where many of you have, you know, pretty strict guidelines in terms of taking breaks and being aware of having hydration breaks, for example. Um, this isn't consistently the case, certainly not across UK and Ireland. So um, call handler here was identifying that actually it would have helped uh, to have more breaks. Now again, we're still not clear about what the optimal rest time would be. And uh, you know, in business, you don't want to miss time out. So uh, we were just discussing earlier about you know, what's the impact of those short micro breaks on the voice. Again, that's something else we really don't know, but we have to learn more about what, how do we optimize the environment. And I guess it could be things like dealing with, you know, perhaps taking a few emails, yeah. uh, just to sort of break up the, uh, the you know, the, the, the rest on the voice. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And also the change in positioning, you know, if you're sitting in a similar position or your posture isn't appropriate, as Tony says, if we're not sitting in an optimal position, then we're not powering the voice with the optimal level of, of air support to get a strong, flexible voice. So many reasons, many variables and demands. 
what do we do then? This, this term occupational dysphonia, and, and I simply want to identify this at this point, um, a small proportion of professional voice users will suffer from occupational dysphonia, which in, in fact is a diagnosed condition. It's loss of voice in any way. It can define vocal fatigue. It can define vocal strain or for some actual loss of voice, complete loss of voice. For most of us, when we lose our voices, you know, it might be down to uh, acute laryngitis, and that's because of swelling on the vocal folds themselves. So the, there's a physiological reason for that. But for many of us, if we've been talking for long periods of time, and certainly I teach, and if I've taught even for three hours at a time, and haven't been used to doing it, then I notice the difference in quality. And the difference in quality suggests to me that actually that tool, that communication tool, isn't up to par. It might mean I need to hydrate more, but it might be for other reasons. And one of the things we suspect from this research is that for the percentage of call handlers who are going off with voice loss or sore throat, thinking they have colds coming on, it may well be an early indicator or a sign of some degree of vocal strain. So that's something that is, as um, businesses, but also as coaches and as quality teams, we need to be really clear about. But these symptoms were the ones that were coming up in our research. The diagnosis of occupational dysphonia in all of the research that we've looked at across Brazilian research in Finland and in Australia, um, first identified by Sapir in 93 as a voice condition due to voice-related overuse. Now, you know, again, a small proportion. What we are concerned about, both in our research and working with Plantronics, IOSH, and with Tony, is to ensure that we're providing you with the tools that allow your employees to have the very best tools for the job. In other words, preventing any, any damage, but also ensuring that they have the mechanism to be as flexible and sound engaging uh, for the customer. So yet another diagram, maybe slightly too many um, Latin terms in here. Well, we um, will be testing you in the audience on these later. Very good. Well, I'm not sure I would get a very high score, but um, <laughs> I do think it's useful to point out um, the difference between the diagram that um, Tony showed earlier, which is where the vocal folds are. Um, they're not in color here, but they are on the right-hand side. And I, I just wanted to identify the range of muscle groups. For most of us, we're not aware of how we use voice. And I think that's what's interesting. Some recent Brazilian research showed that biofeedback for call handlers did, in fact, have a very productive impact in training. And that's something we're exploring at the moment. So, so these are just beneath the Adam's apple, is it? Or is it slightly above? Yeah, the Adam's apple is your thyroid cartilage. It's actually just behind that. Um, the bands you see, the, the V-shape, are two bands, complex bands of muscle. Um, and, it, you know, it's a bit like, uh, I'm not sure if I should say, but Richard is a, an uh, elite athlete, uh, <laughs> has been uh, doing some cycling. And, you know, I think for somebody who me who doesn't, like me who doesn't do very much exercise, for me to do a, a marathon without training would result in quite uh, extensive damage, I think. Uh, the same thing for our call handlers. If we're expecting them to use that musculature in a very sensitive, very, very effective way, then we need to be aware of how the voice is used. What's interesting for a female call handler is that those vocal cords vibrate and clash together 256 times a second. Now, if that's happening and they're not using their voices in the situation where they've got to raise volume or have impact um, or vary the tone of volume, then you can have a situation where you're either overusing or not using that mechanism or tool as effectively as it can be. So we can all learn, I think, from how the voice is used. Um, and that's um, what we're, we're aiming to do as well in follow-up to this research. Voice-related factors, all of these you'll be very familiar with. The work-related ones that we're most interested in are looking at the impact of room acoustics, the impact of the technical equipment, the headsets that are being used how they dampen down the noise, how they control the environment, um, length of shifts. But on the right-hand side, individual factors. You know, we all know the impact of smoking. What happens in the vocal folds is they become swollen, edematous. They don't come together smoothly, and they create quite hoarse voices at the end. Uh, now, you wouldn't want your call handler sounding like this, uh, I'm quite sure. But even ones where the voice is breathy or weak equally might be ineffective. So there are reasons why it impacts. There is also organizational impact, which is critical uh, to you and your businesses. Um, and this is research back, um, particularly the, the quote by Eunice in 2005. 
Um, our evidence suggests that in the UK we're losing about 50 million, so I'm not sure if that's where we're lower in our estimates, but here we're saying it, it already costs 200 million. I think these are um, figures that we need to, to look at very seriously. Um, this study, very briefly, and you can get further evidence, and I think we'll give you further references on this, but we looked at um, the voice patterns and vocal symptoms of 600 full-time call centers across 14 uh, call centers in, in the UK and Ireland. Um, we had various tools. We used online questionnaire, uh, so they could do voice screening. We could look at the symptoms of vocal strain, but also then we used acoustic analysis for those actual samples. Um, Areas that we looked at, communication environment, very important, um, but also aspects of vocal health um, and also how they felt they were being um, effective. Um, and it was interesting because 10%, 1 in 10, uh, were, were diagnosed with a problem, but quite a number felt it was already beginning to impact or at least they weren't reaching their maximum impact within a voice environment with their, with their voices. So what are the benefits of, of looking at this kind of research? Um, I think the benefits are that we're aware of the, the environment, but also aligning the most important critical tool, the vocal mechanism, with actually communicating with the, the um, environment and customers themselves. The potential benefits to communication style and delivery, um, but also ensuring that through health and safety practices, even general information uh, for those early starts, and we did identify in a research a high-risk group, female um, first starts were most at risk of developing difficulties and problems. So just a, a little bit more information there as to where you can get the IOSH report um, and uh, some further background information if you're interested. And we'll Thanks be putting much. a copy of that link onto the Call Centre Helper website as well. Lovely. So thank you very much for that, uh, Diane. Um, quite interesting, some of, the, some of the research there. You've mentioned hydration uh, a, a number of times, which I guess is, is sort of water and so on. Um, I personally drink quite a lot of quite a lot of coffee. Is is it, does it matter whether it's tea, coffee, uh, Coca Cola, water, or is, or is one particular fluid better than others? Well, I, th I think it, our advice would certainly be uh, drink water, as Tony suggested earlier, and that's mainly because drinking caffeine or alcohol or some medications actually dehydrate the body. So if you're taking oh. four or six cups of coffee a day, then you're already dehydrating the body and the vocal folds as well. I think one of the things we've learned from a European perspective as well, John T, is um, certain countries like to drink milk quite regularly. Oh, right. And we yeah. find that that coats the vocal cords and it gives them less power in their speech. Oh, so it actually makes things worse? Yes. Ah, so not good news for the milk marketing board then. So. <laughs> um, and we've got a, a question that's come in from, uh, from Sharon. Uh, it says, over, hi, over a period of time and voice coaching, would, uh, would the vocal cords not become stronger and the voice requiring less rest periods so as you build your, build your voice up? Yeah, I think that's very much the case. And, it, and it, what is interesting is it's the same if, if you have someone who's learning to do public speaking or singing. They learn to use the mechanism more effectively. And I think our concerns are absolutely around the uh, quality teams doing the initial inductions and initial training. So, you know, to understand the behaviors that might cause damage in the initial stages can have great benefits longer term. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that. And just a reminder, you can ask uh, questions at, uh, uh, at any time uh, would, be, would be great. So we've now just uh, got another poll that we'd like to uh, share with you. Um, and that is, uh, we're starting to look at the, um, the quality of the communications we put out. It's how much background noise is there in your call center conversations? This is uh, effectively what the uh, call center, uh, what the uh, customer hears. So is it uh, very noisy, which is hard for agents to be heard? Noisy, which I would describe as uh, sounds, like a, sounds like a call center. Uh, moderate, which is occasional background noise, which I guess is like a sort of an office background. Uh, none, which is like being on a one-to-one -one conversation with people, or, uh, or don't know. So if you'd just like to uh, uh, vote on that, of what, uh, what you think the sound is like coming down the uh, coming down the line. If just like to uh, vote on that. Uh, now, Richard, you've done a lot of research in this type of uh, type of area. W what would you uh, what would you say is likely to be the uh, the, the most common answer to that? I think because we've been doing this for quite a while now, I'd expect most people to have a good handle on the background noise in their contact centres. We've been to some places that have been very noisy, some sales environments that we might discuss a bit later on. 
but more and more we do see the average coming down within call centers as people look at it as a holistic issue that they need to get a handle on, not just something that they can put a sticking plaster on. Well, let's uh, share the results and see what, uh, what comes out. Uh, surprisingly then, 51% uh, is uh, say your, your background is noisy, sounds like a, mm -hmm. sounds like a call center, uh, or very noisy, hard for the agent to, uh, agent to be heard. Surprisingly, only about 3% of people there uh, say it sounds like a one-to-one -one conversation. So mm -hmm. I guess um, it's probably news for your, uh, for your ears, um, uh, Richard, is uh, things like, presumably, which we might be touching on later, things like noise-canceling headsets can make a big difference. Yep, definitely can make a big difference on that. Well, I think that's a, a good cue then to hand over to, um, uh, to, hand over to uh, Richard, who's going to be t talking us through a presentation on acoustic intelligence. Thank you. All right, thank you, John T. Um, we'll take you through this afternoon is just briefly on the idea of you've now given your agents the best training. You've made them passionate about how they speak. Um, you're really trying to make sure that they don't get stressed, that they don't, their voice doesn't get damaged. So really the first step is to give them the right tools to make sure that their voice can be heard by the customer. Uh, we describe this as, you know, you can't describe how good your customer service is if your agents can't be heard. So back to the, uh, the original diagram that, that um, Tony put up earlier on, and uh, this is how we like to convey our acoustic intelligence. At the top, Hi, we've Richard. got uh, the right conversation, talking about the impact that your speech has got, the training <gasps> courses, the passion that you put into your voice. John T, so you need to share your screen. Up on the yeah. screen right now. Rachel, could you um, put the, the slides up on your screen, please? I'll keep talking. It's a fairly simple slide as we as we go through anyway. Um, the the next level down is the the topic of voice intelligibility, making your voice heard. So this can encompass things like noise cancelling microphones. This can encompass um, getting the background noise right within your call center. Um, and then we sort of come down further to looking at the the right design, the audio ergonomics. And this is all about making sure that the headset is comfortable to be worn. Do you want me to change my slides, Shanti? Yeah. Or they're on Richard's screen, so you'll see the next slide. So this is making sure that the um, headset is comfortable to be worn for extended periods of time. So next slide, please, Rachel. And what I want to get, sort of point you out here is just to have a quick look at what's wrong uh, with this picture here. Now, this unfortunately might be a fairly typical picture view of um, some of the call centers that we walk into. And unfortunately, as good as our technology is, we haven't invented mind-reading headsets yet. So if you look closely enough, <laughs> thanks for the, uh, the online pointer, <laughs> the, the microphone on this headset is pointed up to the, uh, the agent's forehead here. Now, if you go through a call center, if you go through your own call center after this one and have a look around, you will probably find that a lot of people are wearing their headsets in different ways. You're not alone. I see this in every call center I go into, that a really simple first step for us, on the next slide here, please, Rachel. Um, first simple step for us is just to get the microphone in the right place. It really does you know, horrify me sometimes, the amount of times I see headsets, which I see as you know, fairly simple devices to wear. They're being worn in the wrong way, or the microphone is pointing up at the, uh, the next door neighbor, or it's pointing up at the, uh, the ceiling. So first simple tip is really just go out there, audit your call center, and make sure that people are putting the microphone in the right place. And on the screen there, um, we've got someone displaying how the, uh, the microphone should be worn, or the headset should be worn. So make sure the microphone is about two fingers width away from the corner of your mouth. Um, that way it gets easily heard. You may get your voice to be really well heard, and you're not breathing across the microphone all the time. Again, this is something that goes back to the training, is go back and make sure people are doing this time and time again. Audit them. Make sure that new starters know this. Make sure that people are really aware on how to get the most out of their headsets. If you've got some of our headsets that use the, the voice tube technology, then make sure those voice tubes are present. Um, you, if you go and have a, a quick sneaky audit of the contact center, you'll probably find people stirring their coffee with those yeah. voice tubes. <laughs> yep, lovely hygiene there. Um, so again, just make sure those voice tubes are present, that they're clear, and that they're refreshed on a regular basis. So simple things like this can really make sure that your agent's voice is heard really well and truly by the customers, and they are not straining to, to get themselves heard. 
because on calls, customers will give you feedback. I can't hear you clearly is yeah, something we hear far too often in call centers from customers. Next slide. A little bit of a technical diagram here. Um, I won't test you on what the word fricatives mean later on, um, but um, basically again, this is to sort of emphasize <laughs> that speech systems really need to focus on a certain frequency range. And our headsets are all tuned to make sure that we get the maximum intelligibility through those headsets. So you know, if you're a brand new recruited young agent wants to bring in their gaming headset that they use on their Xbox or PlayStation, because they really love it, it's probably not the best tool to be heard clearly on a telephone conversation. So really look to make sure that your speech systems end to end are focusing on this maximum intelligibility um, spectrum within voice here. And in, in telephone lines, I understand it, it's, there's a, a 4,000 hertz cutoff. Uh, uh, the S, the S, S is the H's and the S. Yeah, the, it's the, pretty much those that, that, are, that, are, totally that are difficult to pick up. So yeah. simple things like describing postcodes, things that we use in everyday conversations or credit card numbers. They use a lot of those um, consonants in them. So it's really difficult to hear those sometimes. And hence, you go back to that three to four seconds of call being lost due to repetition or mistakes mm. or yeah. sadly if you don't lose it in the call you lose it later on when somebody calls back because you've done something wrong you've entered data incorrectly mm. next slide just a little technology briefer here we hear the words noise cancelling used on a regular basis um, and it's become a lot more prominent recently things like the formula one headphones the headphones that you get on planes now those are noise cancelling headphones designed to get rid of background noise to help you hear things better. What we're using in our headsets is noise cancelling on the microphones. Now that makes sure that your agent's voice can go out clearly, that they are the ones being heard above the background noise. So in a sort of busy hubbub environment of a call centre, when the microphone is positioned correctly, Getting it right means that the background noise is cut down an awful lot, and again, it's the agent's voice that can be heard. They don't have to strain so hard to make their voice heard. They can talk more naturally. And certainly some of the noise cancelling technology is very good these days. I've, I use a, a call center noise cancelling headset in the car, <laughs> and uh, people really can't hear any, any background road, road noise. Very, very good. I hasten to add when it's safe and legal to do so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Rachel. Next slide. Now, if you've been um, following any of the, uh, the Twitter comments I've been making on this already, you'll have seen Tony standing up to do his presenting. You'll have seen John T. and Diane stand up to do the audience exercises. And we think that having people sat down at their desks, scrunched up, um, restricted vocal cords, compressed airways, it's very difficult to put some passion in your voice to really convey that you mean that empathy to your customers. So we really think that getting people standing up within the call center is going to really help get someone's point across. Um, we see it here within our own sales environment. Everybody within Plantronics gets wireless headsets. And the amount of time you see people walking around on calls, pacing around, um, we can really make sure that people get the full range of their vocal abilities onto a call. So something simple again, like a wireless headset, giving you that freedom to stand up and to talk even if you don't move far away from your desk, just that freedom away from the cords to stand up and talk and get the sort of full vocal power into your, into your conversation with the customer. Next one, Rachel. The next chart is a little bit of a description on background noise levels and really trying to reference it back here to, to noises that you hear in different environments. I'm really hoping that some of you here, when you describe the noise levels in your contact center, weren't up on the, uh, the right of the picture there with the, the gunshots and the firework type of levels. What you're aiming for in the contact center is to really be down at that 60 dB level, normal conversation, or even lower than that. That's the sort of level that we find in a contact center is really conducive to giving good vocal um, performance. And also, it really helps on the opposite side in that the agents can actually hear the customer above the background noise as well. So it works for both sides of the conversation. Now, if we move on to the next slide, what we've got are some little simple tips here about how you can not make it noisy in the call center. And again, I've seen this in call centers. If you're doing these sort of things, don't worry, you're not alone. We just need to figure out how to fix them. But don't hold your team meetings within the call center. 
team meetings can be really sort of motivational, but if you're getting people shouting, if you're getting people really encouraged to participate whilst other people are on calls, it's really difficult to get your voice heard when you're talking to customers, if people are in the background making lots of noise. If you're in a sales environment, we've been to places where you've got bells and klaxons and whistles that signify large orders. <laughs> and again, I can't think of anything worse to distract you or to really give a poor impression to a customer. All of a sudden, that agent can't be heard above the background noise. I put white noise generators here in a bit of a question mark that you know these are possible solutions for some call centers, but you've got to understand the way they work. They don't make it quieter, but they make the background noise more constant so that you cut out the pauses between speech. So you get a constant level of background noise that people just don't get distracted by. And you, you, uh, as I understand, you've got white noise generators in the, in the offices here. Yep, we have white noise generators here, and people actually complain that the noise is higher when we turn them off <laughs> nowadays. So, it certainly sounds very quiet in the, in the offices when we walked around right earlier. Today is an exceptionally busy day in the office as well. Yeah. Um, and also, you might have designed your call center to be looking really cutting edge with its nicely polished wooden floors, its perspex surfaces. But all of those constitute a really big problem for noise echo. So any speech that you make within that sort of well highly um, polished call center will just bounce off the walls and come back. And you'll get lots of echo and there'll be a higher level of background noise when you're in that sort of environment. On to the last slide then, Rachel. What I wanted to really do here is just sort of bring up some overall conclusions from all of the speakers today. Um, and the big one is for me that there is a real cost to the business of taking voice for granted. I think we're all guilty of, you know, we all use our voices every day, but it's something we just take far too much for granted. We just treat it as something that's there and it recovers quickly. If I go back to the figures that we had about the number of people losing days through voice, I wonder whether that's just people aren't recognizing the symptoms. They think it's something else like a cold. So I think that we're taking, ourselves, taking our voice too much for granted at the moment. You, if you've got an overused voice, someone's got a hoarse voice, they can't tell customers how good your customer service is. So for me, it's train, train, and train again. Um, it's the first time I've ever been called an elite athlete, but anyway, it's <laughs> nice to hear that. But you know, the principles that you apply to training anywhere else should be applied for the call center, and not just for scripts, not just for technology, but the voice as well. Simple solutions, hydrate well. We've all got glasses of water in front of us today. Make sure your agents can be heard by getting the headset set up correctly. Get rid of the background noise as much as possible and try and get people standing up and talking so they've got the full power of their voice in the conversation. Okay, Richard, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. I think there's some uh, very, very good tips in there. I certainly think um, you know, looking at the, uh, the, the audio tubes is a very, very quick and easy win that we could do you know, immediately after this, uh, immediately after this uh, webinar. So um, it's now the point of the uh, of the agenda where we throw up the uh, uh, agenda to the uh, audience. We've, uh, so there's a bottle of champagne for the best uh, best tips. The uh, first tip uh, we've had is uh, we use uh, white noise generators here, and uh, and they are excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, so thanks to Ebony for sending that in. Uh, we'll come back to uh, any more tips. Uh, in uh, in a minute, right? We'll now go on to some of the uh, some of the uh, audience questions. Uh, the first question sent in by Marie: uh, We're working in a busy call center. Our agents can sometimes talk for two to two and a half hours non-stop before having a break. In your opinion, are we expecting them to go too long without giving their voices a rest? I think it uh, it depends really there on the work that they're doing and the, the ratio of talking to listening with the customer as well. So if they're, if they're mixing up call work with off-call work like social media or like email, then okay, that's a sort of good informal break. Um, but in terms of talking to listening as well, if they spend a lot of time talking, then you know, that feels like quite a long time. It wouldn't be my, my preference to talk for that long. Ben, would you agree? Yeah, I, I think if it's consistent then that is a, a you know, fairly high demand. Although, you know, from our evidence, there are some call centers where people are talking for four or five hours before they're really getting a significant break. So, you know, you're obviously thinking about it. And, you know, I think two to two and a half hours in some contexts would be fine, but you'd have to look at what the interaction is. And I guess to some extent, Tony, it comes down to, uh, comes down to training. Because, for instance, 
uh, you know, Tom Jones in concert, you know, can certainly go on, uh, go on very well for a, for a couple of hours. So I guess you know, the, the better trained the voices are. Um, does that make a bearing? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, said that Frank Sinatra, who not with us now, but one of the most famous voices of the last century, uh, used to train so he could hold those long notes at the end of songs uh, by swimming underwater and holding his breath. And that was the way that he dealt with being able to just train the voice to allow it to become extended beyond anything that we would be able to do. So I think it's practice. And the other point I would make about the question about the length of time, just about the people side of things, is you've got to ask yourself the question, if somebody's on calls for two and a half hours, what level of motivation have they got in themselves to transmit to your customers if they've been working that long, that hard, without a break? And I think that's quite an important factor you need to build in. Yeah. And we've had a question in, uh, which we haven't got on the, on the screen, from Asif. He said, uh, what if we have a two-sided headset? I guess that's what they call a bi binaural headset. Does that have any impact on, 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 the, on the noise impact? It's one of those factors that we call psychoacoustics. Um, and it's very much a case of if you put headphones on somebody, what we tend to find is that sometimes they actually talk louder because they can't hear themselves talking. And so they actually talk louder to compensate, which raises the background noise throughout the rest of the contact center. Now again, it's one of those things that we, uh, we observe across different countries is that places like Germany, places like France prefer the two-sided headsets because they prefer to just be focused purely on the call. Whereas in the UK, we seem to be a lot more focused on listening into a little bit about what's going around with our team, for example. Um, so if you can put two, two um, binaural headsets, was the, the term we use internally, but I would I would caution against it if you're trying to reduce background noise because sometimes we do find that people talk louder when they wear them. Okay, wonderful. We've had a tip sent in by Stuart. Uh, Stuart says, to save straining people's voices, you can rotate staff between voice and non-voice duties, mm -hmm. emails, yep. for instance, yep. which I think would be, uh, would be quite, a, quite, a good, uh, quite a good tip there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have we got another tip there? Um, Rich, up on the screen. Oh, it's the same one. Uh, Rich, if you move to slide six, I think there's another question there. We up to slide six. There we are. So, um, question for the order for the speakers: Do you have any tips for embedding soft skills into culture when it is removed from quality? We have had soft skills within our culture for two years and his quality checks is about to be removed as a business decision. I'm responsible for soft skills of our teams, but I'm sure how to keep the motivation going on it long term once the checking stops. So uh, could they do anything? Um, Tony, have you got any pointers for the uh, audience about how to keep the, the soft skills going? Well, I think uh, we found, uh, working particularly in contact center environments, that a lot of the team motivation comes within the team. And once there is recognition about how important voice is, added to then developing some skills which they notice in their colleagues, you can run exercises that just keep the whole thing front of agenda, introduce some good interpersonal interactions, get people commenting, noticing when people are doing well. So I believe it's a cultural thing. It has to be a cultural thing in the business. and. Uh, it's an interesting statement here from Nicola that uh, that uh, it's quality checked but about to be removed. I'd be quite interested to know how that decision has come about. Yeah, that's uh, quite, quite interesting there. Uh, Gareth asked, would you advise turning off the radio strip music in the, at the back of your call center? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. It's a, it's a source of background noise. Um, again, different cultural things. People have radios on. Um, if it's overheard by customers, I don't think it projects a particularly professional image. It sounds like you're calling into a, you know, a warehouse type of environment rather than a, you know, a high service uh, call center. And also, again, it raises the level of background noise. You've got very little control over what that background noise sounds like. So for me, then, then yes, I would turn it off because, again, it's a distraction for some people as well. 
but if they're listening to the music, they're not maybe focusing on the customer conversation that should be going on. Yeah. And Joanne asks, where can I find more information uh, relating to training people to have a better understanding of their voice and how to use it better, and also how to raise awareness with other managers and quality teams to look for it when possible? And certainly, the quality is an interesting one because we do often score quality based on what people say, the words they use, not I don't think there's many places that, that look at the look at the tone of voice. I, I think some do. I mean, we worked with some quality teams that did in terms of the pitch and volume aspects, um, and it was linked to intelligibility. But if the quality of the voice is poor, then you don't have a medium for the communication. So, I think that's critical. Uh, uh, I, sorry, I just was going to identify in relation to the question. Um, I mean, obviously, speech impact is something that that is a tool that, and training package that works very well, but. There's an organization, Voice Care Network UK, who also do some voice training. Oh, right. Um, and we're looking at developing online training tools as well. Uh, and Tony, you, you do, do voice training within your organization? Yes, indeed. And if you want to get some information about the uh, speech impact training uh, in partnership with Plantronics, you can go to uh, crawfordpresentations.com and click on the speech impact uh, uh, ident. And also with Plantronics, uh, through Plantronics website, Richard? We just send um, your details straight into Call Center Helper, and John T will pass them on to us. We can be in touch with some detailed information about voice training, um, not just for the call center, but for the whole organization to make sure that everybody's aware about the importance of voice. We've got a few more tips, and we'll share all the tips that have come in at the uh, uh, end of the session. Uh, be careful where you physically locate different teams. Excitable sales teams can often generate a lot of noise over and above on an inbound service team. We've positioned our more noisy teams away from the quieter based yep, teams. I think that's a, that's a, that's a fabulous, uh, fabulous one. We, um, and Stuart has also said uh, voice training is essential, uh, particularly for offshore contact centers. Uh, accent neutralization, etc., is proved to be critical for our customer satisfaction. We have adapted specific training for our offshore agents to target their different voice needs. So I think that's a, that's a good one, uh, good one there for Stuart. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for in 